Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Thank you so much for choosing to worship with us here at Pathway. We are so glad that you're with us. If it's your first time worshiping with us, we have something called a connection form found in the pew back in front of you, or we have it on our website. That's just so we can stay connected with you and get you plugged in. If you or a loved one is in need of prayer, this is for anyone, go ahead and fill out one of those cards found in front of you as well. We pray over you guys as a staff every single week. We just have a few announcements before we get started, and the first... Just want to remind all of our pre-K through 5th grade friends that we have Spark Kids Club this Thursday at 6 o'clock. And for all of our middle school and high school friends, we have Stoke Youth Group from 7 till 8.30 tonight. Also want to remind all of our middle school and high school friends that if they want to join us for April Insomnia, we need registration fees for that by tomorrow. If you have any questions on it or would like more information, reach out to me as quickly as you can. It's going to be a great event for us and a bunch of other area churches getting together with our students and just having a great time. It is not too late to sign up for Women's Retreat. It's coming up this next weekend, but you can still register. We want as many ladies with us as possible. Go ahead and head to our website or Miracle Camp's website to register. This is a whole weekend full of fun, fellowship, worship, and growing. And we just want to pack out the place if we can. We can't wait to be with you guys. On April 28th, as part of the service at the 9 o'clock, uh, Jim Krause is going to be performing excerpts from The Good Shepherd. Uh, it should be an amazing time with some great music. We hope to see you there. Uh, again, it should be a beautiful worship experience for us all. We are looking to grow our funeral luncheon team. We actually have a funeral luncheon coming up this next Saturday, and you can sign up for that through an email from the office through sign up. And you can see through the website what has already been signed up for, what jobs people are going to be doing. Um, but the more hands, the lighter the work, right? And so we would just love to grow this team. Basically, luncheons are here to just help people for those who are grieving. And we love to provide this as a church family, um, whether you're providing food or you're being here as a server or cleaning up afterwards. There are so many different ways to help. If you have any questions about that or just want to have a conversation, go ahead and contact me. Some of you may have already noticed an email that came last Friday from the office with a Google form in it. This form is just for contact information and it is just for our offices and admin purposes only. We are going through our system and completely updating everyone's contact information, making sure everything is correct so we can get you guys the information you guys want and need. Um, please fill out this form. We need every single person to do it, whether you fill it out in your email or if we don't have the correct email or you don't want to do it on email or you don't have one. We also have physical forms found at the welcome desk out in the lobby. And then there is a box that you can place that in afterward. Again, this is just for our office because we're updating it and making sure it's super clean, simple, and correct. And we thank you in advance for filling that out. Lastly, we've said this a few times, but we could really use some more help at our sound desk, running slides, running the soundboard, running the camera. Uh, this not only helps our in-person worship on Sundays, but also for the videos that we post every single week. If that seems like a place where you feel like you would like to get plugged in and get trained in, uh, let me know, let Savannah know, let Dan know, let Scott Risk know. There are so many people that would love to get you plugged in uh, so you can just help us make our Sunday services as amazing as they are. Now that's enough announcements. It's time to worship together. Good morning, church. It's good to have you here this morning. It's a beautiful morning. Let's stand and sing together. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Taste of the water, come. No more. Come, all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Come lay them down. 
Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Can you see his open arms? For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him. It's a beautiful morning. It is great to have you here. And as uh, just in case anybody was wondering what the dumb grin on my face is, I want to make sure I have a dumb grin on my face rather than some sort of scowl. I was thinking about that this past week, and I'm like, I think my resting face is kind of a downturned face. So I'm, so I'm practicing. I'm practicing just having a smile no matter what's going on. I saw some of you also uh, talking about that to yourself. I could see it in your, in your eyes and your lips. You're like, I think I should, I think I should smile. I'm happy. It's, I'm happy to be here at church. I'm happy to be in, in worship. It's also hard to talk like this, but it's a good thing to practice, a practice an attitude of thanksgiving, an attitude of praise. Uh, I'm happy. It's blessed. My father-in-law had a cruddy day this past week. He's had several, but he was talking to his his oldest son, and he said, here's all the rotten things that happened. And here's some good things that happened. And he got to the end of the conversation and said, that was a good day. And it's just like, man, what a lesson. What a lesson. We have a lot of things to be thankful for. Let's continue to sing and praise. the sun to rise every morning, colors the sky with the shades of his glory, he wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does, who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for Every sorrow carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living in 
us when I was a sinner. You saved me from who I was. Cause what Jesus does. Who understands the heart of the sinner? Showers his grace over all our mistakes. Washes us clean with his blood. Jesus does. Who sings the song of sweet forgiveness? Who stole the keys to hell and the grave? Who has the power to save? Jesus does. Father who gave us the Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. That's what Jesus does. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Oh, we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Amen. Let's bow in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for a great day. It is a great day and our hearts are smiling and hopefully our faces are smiling along and vice versa. If our faces are smiling, hopefully our hearts are smiling along, knowing that you have blessed us with so many good things. And some of us come to worship, and we're ready, and we're happy, and just in praise, having a great week behind us and looking forward to another great week. Some of us come to worship when it hasn't been a great week, and you woke up tired and you went to bed even more tired. And the things in between were nothing to write home about. No matter where we are, we are here now to, to worship. We are here to lift your name. We are here to open our hearts, to follow you, and to leave this morning when it's time to be energized, rejuvenated, with the strength of your good word, the love that you have shared to us and the gifts you have given. We're thankful to gather. And through your son we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. Thank you, praise band. Well, good morning, church. I'm Pastor Dan, the senior pastor here, and we are really glad you've chosen to worship with us today. Hope you've enjoyed worshiping so far. And this time I want to dismiss the kids, the children's church. Uh, go and learn a lot about the Lord and have a lot of fun and come back and share with your church family what you learned. Uh, for those of us that are going to remain in here, I'm, I'm going to, I want to read a scripture passage to you today. It comes from the book of Jonah. And I'm going to read all of chapter 1 to you, verses 1 through 17. 
And it says this. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amatai. Get up and go to the great city Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. And fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help, and they threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep down in... So how can you sleep at a time like this? He shouted. Get up and pray to your God. <clears throat> Excuse me. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, the lots they identified Jonah as the culprit. Why has this awful storm come upon us? They demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were terrified when they heard this, for he had already told them he was running away from the Lord. Oh, why did you do it? They groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to you to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rowed even harder to get the ship to the land. But the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. O oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, and don't hold us responsible for his death. O Lord, you have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up and threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Well, today we're going to begin our series on Jonah, and for the next four weeks we're going to be in the book of Jonah, learning from his life, and hopefully we'll apply a lot of these truths and, and this knowledge to our own lives so today I want to ask a lot of questions. I want to start out by asking a question, who was Jonah? Well, Jonah was a prophet from the nation of Israel. There's Israel and Judah this time. He was a prophet from Israel. Uh, he was from a town called Geth Hefer. In, in, that was in the northern kingdom. And Jonah ministered and prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II. So that was a, and Jonah, Jeroboam II ruled over Israel from 790 B.C. to 749 B.C. So Jonah walked the earth roughly about 2,800 years ago. Now I want to ask another question. What did God tell Jonah to do? Well, in verse 2 of this chapter, God tells Jonah, Get up and go to the great city Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. So Jonah's just basically told, go to Nineveh and preach judgment, preach destruction. <laughs> God's going to destroy this city for its wickedness. But then what does Jonah do? He disobeys God. Hear that? He disobeys God, and he hops on a ship heading in the opposite direction of Nineveh. He, hops on a, he goes down to Port of Joppa and hops on a ship heading to Tarshish. 
But the big question I want to ask today is why? Why was Jonah so against going to Nineveh? Well, if you don't know, Nineveh was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, and the Assyrians were, were the enemies of Israel. Here's a little history between the Assyrian Empire and the nation of Israel to give you an idea of why during this time Jonah probably didn't care for the Assyrians and want to go to their capital city. In 853 B.C., 11 kings, including King Ahab of Israel, joined forces to fight against the king of Assyria at the Battle of Karkar. The battle ended in a stalemate. However, over the years, the kings, the kings of Assyria continued to attack and to expand their borders of their kingdom. And for many years, Israel watched this, this Assyrian empire grow bigger and stronger and get closer and closer to their borders. Then in 1841 B.C., Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, he defeated, the king, he defeated King Hazael from the Aramean Empire. And he took everything from him except for the capital city of Damascus. And there the king of Aram, of Arams, stayed while under siege, locked in, his castle, locked in his castle, locked in his city. And the rest of the Aramean Empire was now part of the Assyrian Empire. Also in 1841, the Bible tells us that King Jehu of Israel paid a large tribute, a large sum of money to Assyria to keep them from attacking Israel. The Bible mentions this, and there's actually been a black obelisk found in Nineveh with, king Je with a picture of King Jehu bowing before the king of Assyria and offering his tribute to him. Not something a king really wants to do, right? Bow before another king, pay them a lot of money just to keep them from attacking you. Very humbling experience, I'm sure. And something else we need to, you should know is this. The Assyrians, they were a very brutal people. And they were very harsh and brutal towards their enemies. There are pictures of the Assyrians stabbing many Israelites through with a long spiky pole. Thus depicting that the Assyrians enjoyed killing the Israelites or, or depicting the fact that they killed many Israelites. And Israel lived for many years with the Assyrians, raiding their lands, killing their citizens. And they lived for many decades, worried that the Assyrian Empire would attack them and take their nation over like they'd done to so many of the nations around them. And as the Assyrian Empire grew, so did the capital city of Nineveh. In Jonah's day, Nineveh was considered a great city, one of the largest cities in the world at that time. It was, it was and just according to Jonah, it says that there were over 120,000 people living in the city of Nineveh at this time. Just a little historical note, Nineveh continued to be a large city, a thriving city, a powerful city, until 612 B.C., when the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Scythians, and the Chimerians all joined forces together and sacked the city and destroyed the Assyrian Empire. All these empires that Assyria had taken over, Babylon, the Scythians, the Persians, they'd taken them and made them vassal states. Well, eventually all those countries joined together and rebelled, brought about a civil war, and destroyed. they destroyed the capital, and then they continued to attack, and they destroyed the Assyrian Empire. And then the Babylonian Empire rises <laughs> after that. So let's go back to the question, why was Jonah against going to Nineveh and prophesying destruction? One, Jonah probably hated the Assyrians and he wanted nothing to do with them. Two, Jonah was probably afraid to go to Nineveh. He's afraid to go and preach there and preach the message God gave them. He probably saw it as a death sentence. I mean, seriously, think about this. Let's modernize this. What if God called you to go to Tehran, Iran, the capital city of uh, Tehran, the capital city of Iran, and go and tell the people that the God of Christianity says you're wicked and evil and he's going to destroy you. How many people would be thrilled about that calling? <laughs> I'm like, ah, I'm, you might need to give me some more signs, God, <laughs> before I go and do that. Yeah, we'd see that as a death sentence or something so scary to do, something we really wouldn't be all that excited about doing. But that's exactly what Jonah was called to do. 
Go to your enemy's capital city. Tell them that the God of the Hebrew people sees their wickedness and he's going to destroy them for their wickedness. That's what he's told to do. And then a third reason Jonah probably didn't want to go there is because he probably didn't even want to give them a chance to repent. He probably wanted to see the destruction of Nineveh. I mean, that'd be great for Israel, wouldn't it? For God to come and destroy the capital city of our enemies, weaken them so they can't attack us. So that's another reason why Jonah probably did not want to go to Nineveh. But what were the results of Jonah's disobedience? Well, the most obvious thing is it put his life and the life of others in danger. Jonah's disobedience to God did not just impact him. It impacted every person on that ship. All the people on that ship thought they were going to die in that storm. I mean, when you read this story, these people, these grown men, they are scared. They're terrified. They are crying and praying out to their God to save them. They're throwing car valuable cargo overboard to lighten the ship so the ship doesn't take on so much water. They're afraid that they're, they're bro their boat's breaking apart. They're afraid that this thing's going down and they're going down with it. And that they're going to die. And they, they see this storm as not just any ordinary storm. They see this as a storm from the gods. Because you see them, they, they cast lots to see which person displeased their god. And to try to figure out who, is who, who, who did this. Who displeased the gods that the gods would do this to us? And when they cast the lots, the lots land on, on Jonah. So Jonah's the culprit. Jonah's the person that brought this on. And he tells him, yeah, it is me. I'm running from my God because I don't want to do what he's called me to do. And they groan, Jonah, why did you do this? <laughs> now we're all going to die. And these guys, when they, they ask Jonah, what do we have to do to please your God? Jonah says, throw me overboard and the storm will stop. Do they throw him overboard right away? No. When they hear that, they're like, no, we can't do that. I don't want guilty, I don't want blood on my hands. I don't want to throw you overboard knowing that you will die. You will surely die out in this rough waters in the sea. So they get behind the oars again and they start rowing like crazy trying to row that boat back to shore. And they get absolutely nowhere because the storm is so rough. And after a while they realize all their work and all their effort is useless. And they realize they don't have a choice. So they take Jonah. But before they throw him overboard, I love that they say this. Is that the people prayed to Jonah's God said, God, don't let us die for this man's sins. And don't hold us responsible for his death. Don't hold us responsible for what we're about to do. That's probably going to lead to this person's death. Because God, you caused this storm for your purpose and your reasons. And then they take Jonah and they throw him overboard. And the scriptures say as soon as they threw him overboard, the storm ceased. And all the people on the ship were amazed they made sacrifices to Jonah's God, and they promised to serve Jonah's God. So that's the good that comes out of this, this story. And Jonah should have died. The result for Jonah's disobedience should have been his death in that, in that storm, and, and thrown overboard in the storm, and he should have died way out, out, out you know, too far to swim back to shore in the storms, and, and he should have drowned. He should have drowned. But God was gracious and merciful to Jonah. And it says, God sent this great sea creature, is the actual Hebrew word, sent this huge sea creature and swallowed Jonah. And the scriptures end that he's in, the, he's in this sea creature for three days. But I love that this, even though that Jonah was disobedient, God still loved him, God still showed grace to him. God loved those people on the ship and showed grace to them and calmed the storm and they all survived. But what I want us to realize today is that 
disobedience has consequences. And usually, they're very, usually, and I'll say every time, every time you disobey God, it leads to negative consequences. Let's do a quick history through, walk through history in the Bible. I'm just going to share some. There's a whole lot more examples of this. But let's look at people in the Bible who disobeyed God and, the con- and what was the consequence. Moses, when he disobeyed God, it led to him not being allowed to go into the promised land. Saul, when he disobeyed God, it led to the Holy Spirit leaving him and going and resting on David. And it also led to Saul losing the kingdom and the kingdom going to David. We look at Jonah. When Jonah disobeys, it leads to him being in a storm and, and being swallowed by a fish or sea creature and should have died. When you look at King David, when he disobeyed God. It led to sexual sin and led to division within his household for the rest of his life. When the nation of Israel continued to disobey God, it led to their destruction and captivity into Assyria, which took place in 722 B.C. for the nation of Israel, shortly after the days of Jonah. When the nation of Judah continued to disobey God, it led to their destruction and captivity in Babylon, beginning in 586 B.C. These are just a few biblical and historical examples of disobedience to God resulting in negative consequences. And friends, we need to realize, too, that our disobedience to God has negative consequences as well. When we choose to disobey God's commands and we choose to sin, that sin separates us from God and it can lead to a lot of shame and guilt and us feeling distant from God. When we disobey God's commands, it puts our lives on a path of pain and heartache and destruction. If God tells you to help someone and you don't help them, then that person misses out on that help and that aid. Or if God, the Holy Spirit prompts you to help this family and, and you refuse or you, you don't do it, then that family continues in their struggles because you didn't help them. God was not able to bless them because you were supposed to be the blessing. And you refused. And we need to realize that God has blessed us to be blessings to other people. God wants to use us to share his blessings with the world. And when we disobey God's commands, God's word, and we disobey the prompting of the Holy Spirit for us to do good and to help others, we are denying people God's blessings. And if God tells you to share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone, yet you refuse because you're scared or you don't know it's not comfortable or can't seem to find the right time, and we make up all these excuses for why we can't share the good news with our friend or share the love of Jesus Christ with somebody, even though the Holy Spirit put that person on our hearts and he keeps prompting us to do it, and we refuse and we disobey those promptings and, and those commands then that person may never hear the good news of Jesus Christ. They may never repent of their sins. They may never get on that right path. And they may never enter the kingdom of heaven because we were too scared and we disobeyed. Here's my final example. You know, the Bible tells us to worship God over and over again. In Hebrews, it tells us, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Yet how many people in our world disobey and choose not to worship God. Choose not to come to church every Sunday and worship God and to fellowship with other believers. And that disobedience has consequences. They miss out on the opportunity to worship God and to draw closer to him every week. They miss out on opportunities to develop wonderful friendships with other believers. They miss out on the fellowship and the encouragement, the support, the wisdom, and all that that can happen when you're gathered with your brothers and sisters in Christ. But let's also realize, too, that, and, and, what, and, and, and let me go back to this, and what happens to these people? Usually people that are believers that stop going to church, stop worshiping, after a while they get stagnant in their faith. Or they totally backslide in their faith and reject their faith. Why does that happen? Because disobedience to God's words, God's commands have consequences. 
And just like Jonah's choice just didn't impact him but impacted others, these people's choices also tend to usually impact others as well. You choose not to go to church, and that means your spouse doesn't want to go either, or your children don't go either. Then your children never have a chance to worship God, never have a chance to develop friendships with kids their age, never have a chance to develop a biblical faith, and they may never even receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because they weren't brought up in the Christian ways. What are the consequences of that? There are consequences for our disobedience. Disobedience to God's commands and disobedience to God's way of living always leads to negative consequences. It always leads to hurting ourselves or hurting others. It always leads us on a path, leads us off the path of right living and puts us on a path that leads to shame, regret, pain, destruction, and even death. And that's why today I want to encourage you today to be obedient to God. Obey his commands that are found in God's holy word. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit as he leads you and guides you. And obedience to God leads to internal joy and peace and eventually results in reward, the reward of eternal life in heaven with God. Whereas disobedience leads to pain and suffering and eternity separated from God. May we realize today that disobedience to God always leads to negative consequences. And may we be wise and may we choose to obey God. May we choose to obey God's holy word. May we choose to obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit to do good and to be a blessing to, to someone else. May we realize today that disobedience to God always, always leads to negative consequences. So I pray we'll be wise and we'll choose to obey God. Obey the commands found in God's holy word. Obey the Holy Spirit when he tells us to do something, no matter how hard or how difficult that is. May we be obedient and faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the example that Jonah sets for us and many others in your word of how to live a holy and righteous life, but also the scriptures show us disobedience and the consequences of it. I pray today, God, that we would choose to be obedient, that we'd choose to be faithful, that we would become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, every day, and may we become more loving, more perfect, more righteous, more holy, more good. And God, I pray that as we obey you, that you would use us to be a blessing to those around us. May we be a blessing to our family, to our friends, our coworkers, our classmates. May this church be a blessing to the community and many people all over, all over this world because we are obedient to you. Help us to be obedient to you, God, today and forever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to take up an offering, and today we're going to be, we're going to be blessed. Jeremy Ponzi is going to sing a special music piece for us today during the offering. If you're worshiping with us, you know you can always give as you come in or as you leave. There's an offering plate back there. If you're worshiping online with us, know that you can also welcome and invited to give as well. Um, we could use your support. And so you can go to our church's website, pathwaymethodist.org, and donate there. Or you can send a check through the mail, 2950 Lakeview Avenue, St. Joe, Michigan. Uh, but know that your gifts will go to keeping these doors open and the word of God being preached and, and the wonderful ministries and, and, and missions that go on here. Uh, we continue to strive to be a blessing to this community every day. But it's through your gifts that we can be even a bigger blessing. So we hope that you will give. And I also hope you'll enjoy this special music piece sung by Jeremy today. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Is it on now? Okay, good. Um, again, I usually always say that I don't look for music to... Thing, it usually finds me, and again, in a <clears throat> month or so ago, my wife and I sat down on a cold, lingering winter day to watch a movie, and we ended up watching Seven Days in Utopia, and it was about a golfer, and he just kind of had to retreat to 
this area. Uh, now that I remember, his car broke down, so he kind of got stuck in this small town. And they kind of took him in, and I guess his life kind of flashed before his eyes that he had really lost his faith and belief, and things started, it started coming back to him, you know, and he, the song that I was going to sing is called Born Again by Third Day. So I know when I heard that song, it was just like, man, how many times have I been born again, or how many times can I be born again? But we all go through something, you know, trials of life, and we come out renewed. Um, the story I shared earlier that about 13 years ago, I asked my dad, he's a pastor, I asked him to re-baptize me from, you know, I was a baby when I was baptized. And I told him I wanted to be baptized in the Lake Michigan. He's like, ooh, that's cold. But he did it anyways, you know. And the funny story is, too, my mom wanted a picture and she missed it. So she was like, do it again. So, so I've been triple baptized. But <laughs> I never have seen that picture. But um, again... To be born again, you know, you just realize you're walking, walk with God, and it could be life-changing, a change of heart. Uh, you're born again into the kingdom of God. Um, one of the quotes that I got from another song by the Gaither Band, the Gaither family, they had a song called Born Again, too, and that's how I found it. But it was, one day I prayed, Jesus, take my sin away. Born again, there's really been a change in me. Believe and be born again. It's all about that change. So again, I'm going to try this song. <clears throat> Didn't do the harmonica on the first service. searching all these years and the man that I saw he wasn't at all who I thought I'd be well I was lost when you found me here and I was broken beyond repair and you came First time. 
Thank you. I don't know how you play guitar, sing, and play harmonica all in one song, but it's amazing. So thank you for sharing your talents with us. And friends, that's what it's all about, right? Being born again. We're about to take Holy Communion to remember Jesus' death. But why did Jesus go to the cross? He went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, but he went there so we had, would have a chance to be born again, to be forgiven of our sins, and to find new life through Jesus Christ. So I invite you to pull away the cellophane wrapper, take the bread, eat it, and remember and be thankful for what Jesus Christ did for you. And peeling back the aluminum foil to reveal the juice. This juice reminds us that the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was poured out at Calvary to pay the penalty for your sins and for mine. I pray that as you drink it, you'll ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to make you his child. Today, if you've never been born again, I pray you'll ask Jesus Christ into your heart and you'll experience that born again, that salvation through Jesus Christ, that joyous new life. Today, let us drink. May we be born again. God, we thank you for your love. You love your creations. You want to adopt every human being into your family. You want all of us to find new life through Jesus Christ and to experience that being born again, being brought from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And I pray, God, that there's someone out there today who does not know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray today that they would choose to follow you, that they would repent of their sins and quit living in disobedience and start living in obedience to you. And may they find new life that born-again life through Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a moment. Now let's stand and sing together. Lift your head, lift your eyes, look to the sun. In the test, in the trial, His grace is enough, His grace is enough. Oh, my soul, remember who you're singing to. Take heart, hold on. Remember who you're singing to. He's still the Lord Almighty. He's still the King of Kings. He's still the risen Savior reigning over everything. His name is still the highest. His strength will never fail. His word is everlasting yesterday, today, and forever. Keep the faith fan the flame, don't give up the fight. In the night speak his name, this hope is alive, our hope is alive. Oh my soul, remember who you're singing to, take heart, hold on. Remember who you're singing to. He's still the Lord Almighty. He's still the King of Kings. He's still the risen Savior reigning over everything. His name is still the highest. His strength will never fail. His word is everlasting yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus, 
Amen. Thank you again for worshiping with us this morning. Go out and have a great day. Have a blessed week. Obey God. That's like the summary of the, of the sermon right there. Obey God, and we'll see you next week.